Let me say uh, this. We wish each and every mother here a very, very sacred and blessed Mother's Day. In Mexico, they actually celebrate Mother's Day each year on a given date. It's May 10th. So those of you that have already done your celebration for Mother's Day, you get two of them, all right? Uh, this is the day that the Western culture here celebrates it here. And it is one that I want us to truly honor the ones that are in our lives that make such a huge, huge difference. This morning's message is actually going to touch on some of those things here. The title of the message this morning is called Leave a Light On. And no, this is not an advertisement for Motel 6 or anything like that. They're Leave a Light On. We're talking about doing something, having some action that leaves a legacy for those that will follow us. Everybody understand? Okay? This, this message today is important to each and every one of us. In Psalm 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. And it's the Word of God, as we know, that lights our way. And it is this light that we want to keep lit so that we can leave a legacy of the testimony of God's absolute goodness and God's absolute truth. Amen? We're reminded of the importance of His Word and of that light when we read Psalm 138 and verse 2. It says, I will worship toward Thy holy temple and praise Thy name for Thy loving kindness and for Thy truth. For Thou hast magnified Thy Word above all Thy name. And it is again this Word, the Word of God, the inerrant, that means without fail, it cannot, cannot lie, Word of God that we hold to and that we preach here in this house. Amen? Let's go to that next screen here. Borrowing a quote from Boyd Bailey, who happens to be an author that I follow, also the founder of Wisdom Hunters, a blog post there. He says, it is not necessarily the length of our life that determines our legacy. It is more the length of the shadow of our influence that defines what legacy we leave behind. That makes sense, doesn't it? He also is one that quoted, true motherhood is awake to the needs of others and committed to Christ as the solution. And quite honestly, that is what we see in mothers. That is what and how God created mothers to be. Elizabeth Stone quoted, Once you've become a mother, it's like having your heart go walking outside your body. Again, many of you mothers understand what I'm talking about. Because it is traditionally, and it is likely that it is the mother of a house that follows even after the children leave, or even after a task is completed. It's 
always the heart of a mother that goes beyond in so many, many cases here. And that is again why I will gladly take time to celebrate and honor a mother. Okay? Now, today's message, Leave a Light On, is intended to leave us all, not just mothers, but to leave us all with the hope of the incredible sphere of influence that each one of us carry in this life as a Christian. And the beautiful ways in which God enables every man, woman, and child to do the things that will leave a legacy for future generations to follow. And with today being Mother's Day, it's my hope that we can especially edify the moms and the moms-to-be to know how important and valued they are in our lives. Amen? And you do understand, don't you, that when we use the name mother or mom or mum or midi, mama, mommy, matriarch, boss lady, oh, I'm going to stop there, okay, that, that it does not denote the requirement of childbearing as a prerequisite. Okay? God's Word speaks about many mothers and their leadership role in completing or complementing the fathers. And His Word portrays the extraordinary value and importance that each one carries in life. I want us to go to the next screen. In fact, if we go back to the beginning, Genesis 2 and 18, the Word says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Other translations will say it like this, I will make a helper suitable for him. Or, I will make him a helper comparable to him. Or, I will make man a helper fit for him. And that negative that we hear when God said it is not good, that negative is extremely emphatic. It, it's not the same word construction that you use in saying, well, I, I don't like broccoli. Okay? It's just not good. Okay? That may be true. Okay? It's actually not too bad if you do it right. But it's, it's not the same construction of the language. When God said it is not good, it's totally contrary to the context of Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 2 where we read all through Genesis chapter 1 where God created where God spoke by His Word. God said, ends with, and He saw that it was good. And God said, He spoke, created, looked at it, and said, it is good. All through, you'll see that. Go, go back to it. Underline, and God said, underline, it is good. You will see it six different times, the six different days, things that were created, and He said, it is good. As a 
creation was being spoke. He spoke that every day after that it was good. But when he created man and woman, he saw and he changed it up a little bit and he said, it is very good. Now hear that. Very meaning exceedingly. I've created all of these things. It is good. I have spoken by my word. It is good. But when he created man and woman, he stepped back and he looked at it and he said, oh, that is very, very good. I want us to keep that in mind because it is such a valued thing in God, in his eyes, when he sees a man and a woman that are harmony, in harmony with him in Christ. But the plan, his plan for man was not complete without woman. The emphasis being on the word I will it is not good that the man should be alone. The emphasis was not on he's lonely because he wasn't lonely. He had God Almighty, but he was alone. Let's go to this this to the word here in uh, in this word help. Staying here with Genesis 2 and 18 where it says that I will make him a help. Help is a word that we'll find many times in the Psalms. For example, Psalms 10 and 14. Thou art the helper of the fatherless. Psalm 28 and 7. The Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in Him, and I am helped. Psalm 46 and 1, And God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Psalm 54, 4, Behold, God is my helper. 72, 12, For He shall deliver the needy when He cries, the poor also in Him that has no helper. Psalm 86, 17, because thou, Lord, has opened me, has helped me, and comforted me. Psalm 119, 173, let thine hand help me, for I have chosen thy precepts. Psalm 121 and 12, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. My help comes from the Lord which made heaven and earth. Thus it's not a degrading position for the woman to be called a helper. You following me? The verb form basically means, catch this now, the verb form helper means to aid or supply that which the individual cannot provide for himself. I hope the men in this place got that. I'm going to repeat it just in case. Okay? Because whether you're married, whether you are unmarried, whether you are, well, we're married, it doesn't matter. We're talking again about a union that God sanctified, yeah, and that He wants to use as the perfect example of how He wants us in our relationship to be with Him. Helper means to aid or supply that which the individual, what I cannot provide for myself. The word help is translated as boethos, which is a word the New Testament uses in the sense of physician or helper. 
Let me give you some verses. Matthew 15 and 25. Then came she and worshipped him, saying, Lord, help me, assist me. I need you. I need for you to perform something that I cannot do myself here. Mark 9, 22. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Provide that physician's ability to take care of us. Acts 16 and 9, And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him, saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. Give us the assistance that we need because we cannot do it on our own. Can I get an amen? In Revelation 12 and 16, it says, And the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. Again, the word helper. When God said, I will make a help. I will make a helper meet that is right, that is fit, that is just the right thing that will give that man the ability to flourish. Are you with me? It conveys the idea of aiding someone in need, such as the oppressed. And a godly woman meets this need of man. It's a beautiful thing here. Meet when God spoke and He said, I will make and help meet for Him. Comes from a Hebrew word meaning, get this, opposite. Literally, it is according to the opposite of Him. Think about it. Okay? I will make Him a help meat for him. When we talk about salt and pepper, those are two things that are different. Yeah, when we talk about light and dark, we're talking about two things that are different. So how could it be a help? God, in His infinite knowledge, when He made man, seeing that He was alone, that He needed something to complement or to complete him. He said, I'll make him a help that is meat for him. It will be one that even in their bodies, they join together and they make one. God is so big, so far beyond anything that we even know. But that's why we keep pressing in to understand more here. In another translation, meet means according to Him. I will make Him a, a help that is meet according to the man that I made Him. And it relates to a norm or a standard. She is to be equal and adequate for man. She is also made in the image of God. Thus again, equal to man and not on the animal level of being. I can hear some sacred cows mooing here on, on that. Okay, Please understand, God will not be mocked when he said, I will make and help meet for him, he knew what he was doing. He knew how it had to complement each other. He knew that there were to be lanes that each one carried. Yeah? That each one had a function. That each one was made so that they would be able to again follow and love and worship the Lord God as their Creator. Hallelujah. Genesis chapter 2. 
verses 23 and 24 will say this. Adam said, this is now, he's speaking of, when God woke him up, when God had put him to sleep, okay, when God's anesthesiology, whatever it was that put him under, okay, he wakes up and he sees woman. He says, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. There is so much more we actually are not going to go into, into it here this morning another time. But when God made that helper for man, He made it so that as a threefold cord, okay, the man, the woman, God wrapping all of them together, okay, that he understood that it would not be quickly broken. That the other could help. And that's again why God made man to function as the head of the household. Because the woman was the complement of being able to administer and to do the things that the man, in many cases, speaking just personally, we don't even think about. It's the woman that thinks about, well, we should do this, or we should stop and pray for this, or we should do that. It's the woman whose heart is always walking outside of her body looking for the needs of others that complements that man. And again, it's like the bride of Christ that we are. Are you following me? How we as children, as sons and daughters, we are marrying. We are married to the One that created us. And it is one that is meant to be a unified, single focus type uh, that gives us the ability to please Him. To please each other. And any time that that union can keep the focus with God Almighty as their head, as their one and only love, then taking care of your other spouse and or down the ladder children, then you always know that you will be taken care of. I've told this many, many times to people that we have counseled in marriage or to be married, that no matter what, forget about yourself. Love the Lord God Almighty. Take care of your spouse. If you have children, take care of them. You're on the bottom. But know that because you're there, you're taken care of. Because if the spouse does the same thing, keeping the Lord Jesus Christ as the first love, taking care of her spouse, her children, then that spouse knows I'll be taken care of because I've kept it in the order that God made me in. Amen? Amen. And you know, I want you to go with me here to 1 Samuel chapter 1. And I want to uh, this morning just uh, leave you with four essentials of leaving behind a legacy for those that will follow here. There's many examples in the Word that would exemplify the help and the meat 
that women provide in this world, but one in particular holds my attention this morning. It's Hannah. Joe has already talked about this woman of God that is found in 1 Samuel chapter 1. So go with me to that, that chapter. We don't see a lot written about her herself, but only that she was one of two wives that was married to a Levite named Elkanah, and the name of the other wife was Penina. And we see in verse 6 of 1 Samuel chapter 1 that Hannah was provoked by the enemy and also by the other wife, Penina, who was bearing children for Elkanah, and she made it real clear because Hannah was barren. She was not bearing children. And if you understand anything of the culture back in that day, that was almost like carrying a, a red X on you because it was considered a curse. And if you did not bear children, it was something that was just not comfortable. And Penina made sure that Hannah knew how horrible she was and what a louse she was and such an unfit wife of her husband Elkanah. And it says that the enemy provoked Hannah because she was barren. But what I find is admirable about knowing this is that Hannah was not going to give in to the condemnation to the voice that could have taken her down. Are you hearing me? Her determination is an inspiration to each and every one of us. Let's go to this next screen. Hannah's legacy, what she did to leave behind something of her motherhood, began with the first and foremost prayer. Verse 10 says, And she was in bitterness of soul and prayed unto the Lord and wept sore. She vowed a vow and confessed to the Lord what she would do if He would answer her prayer for a child and that she would give it to the Lord for service in the temple. Here we see the heart of a mother. We see the prayers of a mother. And believe me, over the years and as even I grow older, I see this value more and more. I see the heart of a mother and the difference that she makes. I see the prayers that she speaks holding children, holding families, holding things together. It's through that prayer. It is different than even what the husband or the man speaks. It's a different kind of prayer. I can't hardly really explain it. It's just different. It just is. Go to the next screen, please. The second thing that Hannah did to preserve her legacy was reinforcing those prayers with decrees and declarations. No matter what it looked like to her. Verse 13, now Hannah, she spoke in her heart, only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli, who was the priest at that time, thought she was drunken. What was she doing? She was pouring out with groanings, with things that were far beyond what anybody else could even do. 
She was praying. She was decreeing. She was declaring, My God, You've heard my prayer. You need to hear it, Lord. I vow to You what I will do. I need for You to hear it. She was determined. Hannah replied to the priest Eli that she was not going to be considered as a daughter of Belial. She was not one that was drunken. She says, for out of the abundance of my complaint and grief have I spoken hitherto. She was telling Eli, don't you dare think that I am in sin and that I am just this unfit daughter of Belial, of evil, of the enemy, because I am from what the bottom of my heart is praying, I am decreeing and declaring unto my God what I need to see Him do, and I will see it come to pass here. Amen? Now here's something that's also interesting. It doesn't say that Eli asked her what she was praying so fervently for. It doesn't say, well, what's, what's going on? What's happening? It doesn't give any detail of a counseling session or anything that was happening. Eli saw her pray. He thought she was doing stuff so strangely that she was just being drunk. Instead, it was the Spirit moving in her, decreeing, declaring, groaning. And Eli says, go in peace. And the God of Israel grant thee thy petition that thou hast asked of him. It does not say that Eli even knew what she was praying about. He just saw her status, what she was doing. He could feel, he could sense through the Spirit that this woman means business. And he says, go in peace. May the God of Israel give you just exactly what you want. Go to the next screen, please. What else did Hannah do to leave a light on, to leave a legacy? She received the word of the Lord by faith. It says in verse 18 of 1 Samuel 1, And she said, Let thy handmaid find grace in thy sight. So the woman went her way and did eat, and her countenance was no more sad. Pretty similar to the language that was spoken by Mary when the angel of the Lord came to announce to her that she would be with child and would bear the Son of Man, Jesus Christ. Mary simply in Luke 1 and 38 says, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. Pretty incredible to be able to receive the word of the Lord like that as a mother or a to-be mother and simply say, let it be. This is what Hannah was doing. By faith, she received the word from the man of God, from Eli the priest, said, I'll receive the petition that I am asking of the Lord here. Go to the next screen. Number four, last one. Hannah's legacy was confirmed because she was a keeper of her words and of her vows. Verse 24 says, And when she had weaned him, she had a child. Yeah, she did conceive. They named the child Samuel. And when she had weaned him, she took him up with her with three bullocks and one ephah of flour and a bottle of wine and brought him unto the house of the Lord in Shiloh. And the child was young. What Hannah prayed, what she decreed and declared, 
what she received by faith, she also kept her own promises to the Lord. She brought the young boy to the temple to provide him in service to the priesthood. And I don't think it's coincidental that the name of Hannah in Hebrew means favor or grace of God. Hannah found favor. She knew what it was going to take to break through with her prayers, with her decrees, with her declarations, by keeping her faith, by believing the Word of God. And she kept all of her promises there. Let's go to this last screen. In 2 Timothy 1 and 5, the Word says, When I call to remembrance the unfeigned faith that is in thee, which dwelt first in thy grandmother Lois and thy mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that in thee also. Paul is talking to Timothy, saying, it was because of prayers that your mother, grandmother Lois, and your mother Eunice made that you are able to be where you are at. Think about that, will you? Will you think about just exactly the value that any person has, but especially a mother? Because, as I said at the beginning, there is something different about the ability of a mother to pray for others that sometimes us men just overlook, don't get. Now, I'm not saying that the man does not have the power to be able to execute the authority that is needed to command the enemy and for strongholds to be torn down. I'm talking about the help that God made meet for man that complemented each other so that they could fit and work together. God is amazing. Amen? And you know what's so amazing about the love and grace of our God? It doesn't matter what you are bringing to the table. It doesn't matter if you're single right now. It doesn't matter where you're at, what position in your life or what you're even going through. It doesn't matter what you are bringing to the table or what you even have right here, right now. God's grace, God's mercy is so abundant that He will honor and bless it if we are truly presenting it with a sincere and contrite heart. I think of the verse in Matthew 14 and 17 when Jesus asked His disciples, what do you have to feed this multitude that's come out here? And they answered, just these five loaves of bread and these two fishes. Jesus answered and He said, bring them to Me. Stop and think about it. All that is required is that whatever we have, even if it doesn't look like much, five loaves and two fishes was not going to feed the 5,000 people that were there, obviously. But Jesus said, bring it to me. Bring what you've got. Bring me what you have. Maybe it's not totally sufficient or you feel it's not totally sufficient right now. Bring me what you've got. I will bless it. I will break it. And I will give it to you so that you can feed the others. And that's exactly what happened. He took the bread, 
He broke it. He blessed it. And then he gave it back. And he said, now, go feed them. And they started feeding. And they kept feeding. And they kept feeding. Like, there's still more? They kept feeding. All Jesus said is, bring me what you got. Bring me what you've got. Psalm 78, verse 7 verses says, Give ear, O my people, to my law. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings of old which we have heard and known and our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from their children, showing to the generation to come the praises of the Lord and His strength and His wonderful works that He has done. For he established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel which he commanded our fathers that they should make them known to their children that the generation to come might know them even the children which should be born who should arise and declare them to their children. We're talking about generations and generations to come that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep His commandments. And that's what we do. That's the legacy. That's the light we will leave on for those to follow. That those that are coming behind us will see, I saw the goodness of God. I saw God move in my brother's life, my parents' life. I saw God how faithful He was in everything. I saw the testimony of Jesus Christ being fulfilled. But it's up to us to take each and every day to the Word, to the the Lord that created us, and work again our salvation out day by day. The end of the matter? Well, listen to what Hannah said prays in second chapter of first Samuel verse 1 first Samuel chapter 2 it says and Hannah prayed and said my heart rejoices in the Lord my horn is exalted in the Lord my mouth is enlarged over my enemies hallelujah because I rejoice in thy salvation There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. This is the end of the matter. This is what Hannah saw of God's favor upon her life. And in verses 8 and 9, it continues, and she says, He raises up the poor out of the dust and lifts up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and He hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of His saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. It's all about Him. Can I get an amen? Let's have some music here. Today's message was one of, again, simply the things that the Lord laid upon my heart about the importance of valuing each and every one of us. Okay? Valuing on any given day the female, the the daughters, the mothers that are in our lives. And understand that when we put God's Word into action and work together as a family, as a house, as a church, as we work together to pray and to see God move on our prayers 
that we must know that He is faithful. And that every word that has ever been spoken over you, everything that has ever been spoken over this house will come to pass. But it is true that prayer, it is true those declarations, it is by faith, it is by holding to the Word of God and knowing that He is faithful that these things all will come to pass here. We have a incredible, glorious future ahead. I'm telling you, we do have an incredible, glorious future ahead. In your life, in your individual family's lives, I'd like for us all just to stand together here as we close. And I want to pray. I want to pray in the Holy Ghost that the power of His Word would be manifested for any, for anything at all that is needed. If you've got a need right now as we pray together in agreement God will move he said that he would be in the midst of us where two or more are gathered he said that he would answer he promised to us that his presence will be manifested here Lord I just thank you for meeting needs here I thank you, Lord, for the favor and your blessing upon each and every mother that is here, upon each and every person, Lord, that is carrying, Lord, the burden of responsibility for the prayers that are going forth for family, for the needs, Lord, of those that are in, in the hospital, in, in need of your touch. Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus Christ that you would move mightily as we pray, Lord, have your way. Have your way right now. Just, just pray. Come on. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord God Almighty.